In the pantheon of American presidents, perhaps no one was better prepared for the job than Dwight D. Eisenhower. Today's guest reminds us of the principles that guided Ike's leadership, both in war and in peace. She's Susan Eisenhower, this week on Story in the Public Square. Hello and welcome to Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University. Joining me as he does every week in the co-host chair is my great friend and colleague, G. Wayne Miller of the Providence Journal. Each week we talk about big issues with great guests, storytellers, scholars, journalists, and more to make sense of the big stories shaping the United States today. This week we're joined by Susan Eisenhower, co-founder of the Eisenhower Institute at Gettysburg College and the author of a new book, How Ike Led, The Principles Behind Eisenhower's Biggest Decisions. Susan, thank you so much for being with us. Well, thank you very much. It's great to be with uh, you and Wayne. Well, there's so much that we want to talk to you about, uh, but we, let's let's start with the book. Uh, it's it's a tremendous read. Uh, give, the, give our audience, if you would, just the 30,000-foot the view of it. Well, I think a lot of people can't figure out whether it's a, a, a biography or a history or a memoir or what it is, but I think it's actually a leadership book, and I've just tackled it in a slightly different way. You know, as they say in journalism, um, show me, don't tell me. So I thought I would show leadership instead of, you know, offering like a 10-point plan you can take away from Eisenhower's leadership just to, to do it through uh, storytelling, actually, which is why I'm so thrilled to be on this program. Well, we're thrilled to have you. And, you know, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a fan of, of President Eisenhower's and, and wrote my doctoral dissertation about his foreign policy. Uh, and I, I've always found it sort of almost seductive to read a biography like this uh, and to try to think about uh, whether or not their lessons, their leadership are, are as applicable today as it was when they were actually in office. What's what's the specific challenge that you faced as a scholar writing this, mindful of the world that we're living in today? Well, I'd actually say that I'm a former journalist rather than a scholar, although uh, having spent a lot of time in the think tank community, uh, I certainly got uh, used to um, filling in footnotes uh, every five <laughs> minutes. Um, but, you know, I think one of the biggest challenges was to uh, merge my relationship with my grandfather in some ways and allow it to inform uh, the work because I've spent my whole life trying to keep a firewall up in some way emotionally. Um, and I decided to, you know, take a risk and put these things two together uh, in places. It was hard for me to write uh, because it uh, dredged up a, a lot of things about him that I missed desperately. And and then on the other hand, though in the, in the actual su substance of the book, I didn't have a problem uh, with uh, reading critical analysis uh, of him at all because I was used to that and taught to be able to handle it. But still, you know, there was some emotion in this book, I'll say that. So there's an old line that history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. And a number of the challenges that President Eisenhower faced uh, during his presidency are challenges that, that we're seeing today, obviously many, many years later, but the same essential issues. Maybe you can talk about some of those starting with, with civil rights. Mm -hmm. And you well, know, we're, we're here in the, you know, we're here during a period of, of Black Lives Matter and a whole re-examination and a refreshment of, of that movement. So talk about the parallel there between your grandfather and, and today. Well, you know, I think that's a, it's a great uh, question, Wayne. And one of the things that I think is very important in thinking about his career and how he handled issues as serious as the civil rights question is that he was so used to making, you know, enormous consequential decisions as, as he uh, was compelled to do during World War II as Supreme Allied Commander of Forces in Europe. Uh, and then during his presidency, he was confronted with uh, a completely um, 
uh, new change in how wars were going to be fought in the future because of the advent of the atomic bomb and the hydrogen bomb. So uh, I wanted readers to know that Dwight Eisenhower, the general, and Dwight Eisenhower, the president, was the same person. Now, the reason I gave you that little uh, prelude to civil rights is that he, he looked at strategic questions uh, as a military person would do, starting with what do you control? And uh, his civil rights record is all about uh, desegregating what he could control and then setting up a framework for uh, a longer um, a longer fight that would take a, um, would would occur after he'd already left office. And he did that through um, some very, very strong um, uh, anti-segregationist uh, judicial appointments. Uh, and of course, it was his appointment, uh, Earl Warren, who um, uh, had passed uh, in the Supreme Court Brown versus Board of Education that opened the way for segregating, desegregating um, high schools, especially in the South where most of them uh, resided. But uh, again, he looked at it as a strategic question um, and did not want to lose the four or eight years he had to bring about lasting change that would be impossible uh, to roll back later. So where, where did his commitment to that cause come from? Well, I think some of it came from his, his youth. Um, you know, he came from a deeply religious family. And when they said that uh, uh, all men are created in God's eyes, he actually believed that. Um, and actually, this is one area where I think the scholarship has been weak over the years. Uh, he actually went to um, a, uh, a high school in Abilene, Kansas that had African-American students in his class. Uh, and then during the war, he desegregated the units. He was able to desegregate uh, to give the opportunity to African American uh, GIs to, to uh, or to offer the opportunity of uh, fighting in combat so that they could be elevated through the ranks. Um, and then, you know, back to what he could control when he was actually a president uh, revolved around uh, the desegregation of Washington, D.C., and its schools, which he did control. Uh, it revolved around finishing uh, the work started in the Truman administration on desegregating the military. But I can tell you that when General Eisenhower tells you you have to do a few things, there was enough <laughs> re reflexive response that, that that work, desegregating federal contracting. So it goes on like that. Um, but it, they created precedents that were impossible to roll back. And, and he provided um, the power of the presidency for enforcement around a controversial Supreme Court uh, judgment. Uh, Susan, you know, we live in such a hyper-partisan world right now that it, it, it's hard to remember sometimes the, that there once was an approach to bipartisanship and policymaking. President Eisenhower seemed to prize that uh, in, in, in a lot of different examples. Could you talk to us a little bit about what bipartisanship meant to President Eisenhower? It, bipartisanship meant to Dwight Eisenhower that he could actually make progress for our country. Don't forget it. I, I mentioned the technological revolution, but the post-war period was not just the post-World War II period. Uh, during his first term, he ended the war in Korea and our economy was on a wartime footing. There was a lot of social unrest about uh, labor relations and high inflation and all of that. So he had, uh, you know, he was governing in a tumultuous time. Um, so it was really important to uh, make bipartisanship uh, a real, um, goal because the Republicans had been out of power since the Great Depression uh, and he believed in the two-party system. So he, you know, hung his five stars next to the GOP to bring that party back to life. And actually, that was one of the bigger challenges, um, certainly during his presidency, was converting an isolationist GOP um, into an internationally thinking GOP. Um, in any case, he had to work with everybody in order to get his agenda through. So this is a very intimate look uh, at your grandfather. And, and one of the intimate moments or, or stories that you tell is the bonding he had with his soldiers, yeah. American soldiers especially. Um, talk about that. Not every general has that sort of bond that, that you portray here. Well, I think um, that bond is consistent with his personality. I mean, he really was a people person in so many ways, even though he had to 
stand back and look at things objectively and actually make life or death decisions for the very people he just met. I, I think that must have been particularly hard. But, you know, I think um, most Americans would be interested to know that he was raised in a pacifist household. Um, his mother was resolutely anti-war and all that came with it. And his father's side of the family uh, were conscientious objectors and did not even fight um, in the Civil War. Um, they, um, and so I think he always had at the back of his mind the terrible, terrible human cost. And I'm sure there were times when he could hear his mother's voice, even though he took a different path in life. And I think that is probably the bedrock of the empathy that he demonstrated during the war and later. So given given that background, which, you know, I think will be news to many, many readers and people, why did he go in the military? What headed him down, <laughs> given his lineage and his heritage? Why, why become a soldier and then, you know, a leader in, in, in the army? Well, for all of those who are part of the debate about the cost of higher education, Probably the simple answer is that uh, West Point and Annapolis offered uh, a free education. Seriously, he spent um, two or three of his post high school years putting his older brother through college. And he looked down at the uh, younger brothers and kind of did his math and figured they wouldn't be old enough to put him through college. And a friend of his said, why don't you apply uh, to a military academy because Uncle Sam will put you through, um, you know, college for free. And... Uh, it would shock a lot of people to know that he applied to Annapolis first. <laughs> oh, it's too bold. And then he uh, went to West Point. And, of course, he loved history as a kid. And uh, all of these factors merged. But let's look back and just think about what great parents he had, despite their religious views. You know, he was he was a, uh, a person who was expected by them to make his own uh, personal decisions in life and to find his own way. So one of the recurring themes throughout the book is, and throughout uh, uh, General Eisenhower's life, is is personal accountability. You and I chatted a little bit about this, but I, I have always been just fascinated with the uh, the the handwritten note that he had drafted uh, on the morning of uh, June fifth uh, as the D-Day invasion fleet waited to go ashore, uh, and uh, where he took personal responsibility, even going so far as to eliminate the passive voice and say, this was this was my doing. Um, you write about this extensively in the book. Uh, personal accountability was a, was a priority, a real guiding principle for Dwight Eisenhower. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Well, just as a, uh, a principle, first of all, I think that accountability, I should say quickly, comes from, again, from his uh, upbringing, and then imagine how it merged with the ethos of West Point. Um, and... But I think that the accountability thing is absolutely crucial to leadership. Who is going to follow you into battle if you're going to blame somebody else for your mistakes? I mean, this is all, uh, I think accountability is at the core of trust. And that's what you have to have with the people who are going to implement your decisions, whether they're good decisions or bad decisions. And implicit in that is always loss of life and warfare. Uh, so I think this came naturally to him uh, because of uh, his background again. But, you know, he took it really seriously. And, you know, Jim, to your point, the, I think the most moving thing of all is uh, after launching the invasion and knowing full well that the paratroopers particularly were uh, vulnerable to exceedingly high casualty rates, he still went out and, and looked them in the eyes uh, as they were setting off for Europe and um, asking them about home and giving them encouragement, but never talking to them about what they were about to do, because he was of the belief they knew perfectly well what they were about to do. He wanted to remind them of what they had to live for. So President Trump reportedly referred to uh, America war dead veterans, people who died in World War I, as suckers and losers. And, and understanding you can't speak for your grandfather, but can you imagine how he might respond to to such a reported comment well i know how i responded i mean um it's a, you know it hurts it really hurts um and if you're thinking about world war ii and those people were you know the references to people that my grandfather inspired um to be be bigger than themselves and to associate themselves with a cause that's noble um, that is, you know, foundational uh, to putting something higher than yourselves. There's nothing, uh, there's nothing um, 
that's not about being a sucker. That's that's about being a hero. Susan, I, you know, there, I, I, I read uh, your book, mindful of the just the enduring value of President Eisenhower's diaries, uh, his letters, uh, and his memoirs. And I, 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 I want to ask you a question that we've put to other authors, but I want to, I want to turn it around. Um, so there's a challenge for historians coming down the road because of the age of uh, digital communications and emails and tweets. Uh, that the the body of literature that's available is just not the same as letters and diaries that sort of give us some intimate idea about what people were actually thinking at the time that they were making momentous decisions. The question that I want to pivot around, though, is to sort of turn that lens around and say, is there something that current leaders lose by not having the experience of the reflective kind of thoughtfulness that goes into a letter or a diary, the candid, you know, unscripted, uh, not worrying about the audience. You've got a chapter in the book that talks about when nobody else is looking. Um, you know, what what are we losing? What are leaders losing by not having that same sort of approach to reflection and, and self self review? Well, I think uh, we're losing a lot, and it's uh, from a leader's perspective, they're losing the opportunity to think things through. No great decision was ever made in a noisy room, and without reflection, you know, the outcome is very much in question. I guess if you're a, a political day trader and uh, the results of your work um, happen every 24 hours or every two months or something, that's fine, but if you're a strategic leader, the nation depends on you to uh, think about all the factors that are involved in any big issue. And so I sort of make a, a point of that. Uh, from a, a leader's perspective also, that um, I know that Ike used his uh, diaries as a way to relieve stress. Um, and he had other little tricks too, like he used to write an issue or a person's name on a piece of paper and crumple it up and throw it in his lower <laughs> desk drawer. Um, I, I always like to think his uh, White House secretary probably needed a security clearance just to open that drawer. Because, <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, in any case, he, he did that to get it outside of himself. And so what happens today is that people are just, they become um, more and more um, victim to all of the stresses and inputs that come into them. And, and it's very, very hard to think clearly under those circumstances. So, so given those conditions, uh, the political climate, social media, and, and all of that, is there a way to get back to that type of reflection? And I'm referring, obviously, to leaders, but also people, you know, just ordinary citizens as well, get completely caught up in, in all of this, and I think to great detriment to, to our democracy. Well, I think you're absolutely right, uh, Wayne. I couldn't agree more. And I have to say that... Um, it's a choice. I mean, we could all do this tomorrow afternoon. We could all, you know, uh, cut back on our electronics or hire somebody to do some of that for us if we're lucky enough to find somebody uh, or to be able to afford it or just to simply step back. Uh, it's our choice. And I think that one of the strong points of the book is uh, that I did not believe that leadership is something that's conferred to you from the outside. You know, that's like fairy dust that gets sprinkled on you. So you're suddenly holding uh, the top position. No, he believed that leadership, I mean, I'm, he never wrote it this way, but this is what the combination of my research and having known him very well comes together. He, it came from inside with him. It was, it was a decision he made to be a leader. And then he, he knew that in order to be effective at that, he had to do the following things. And reflection was one of them. Uh, he took up uh, oil painting to try and, um, find personal emotional balance because he did have a bit of a temper um, that he spent his life managing. Um, and I think that's a choice. We could all do that if we wanted to, but we've become almost addicted to these uh, distractions in our lives. You, you talk about your relationship with your grandfather uh, in the book and obviously in this conversation here. What was that like? Did you spend a lot of time with him? Did you have long discussions with him? 
just just talk about the the personal element here because I, I think that's completely fascinating <laughs> and, and it must have been amazing for you to to have this relationship with with such a great figure in in American history well I, I must say that I was I, I got a kick out of the fact that his 1915 West Point yearbook described him as big as life and twice as natural I can tell you <laughs> That, if you want a description of Dwight Eisenhower, that is it. Um, I mean, he, and what I loved uh, about him, I was about 18 or 17 and a half when he died. So uh, I, I did know him well. And after uh, the presidency, we lived on a property adjacent to his farm. During the White House years, we also, for two or three of them, we lived in Washington. So we saw a lot of them. And the thing I loved about him is that what you saw was what you got. He uh, was not a sulker. Um, he uh, didn't carry around things inside of him, uh, anything that feels or looks like uh, um, a regret or revenge or any of those kind of toxic emotions. And um, th I, that's probably where the piece of paper in the lower drawer come in. But um, I, I thought it was wonderful because you every, always knew where you stood with him. Um, and of course, I have to say he probably doted on us, but um, you know, we, we understood the, the authority implied by his personality, let alone the Secret Servicemen who were um, <laughs> protecting the farm and, and certainly the White House. Yeah, you know, Susan, I am uh, I'm mindful of the power of uh, President Eisenhower's rhetoric. He's maybe one of the most important strategic communicators of the Cold War era. He gave us the chance for speech. He gave us the his 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 uh, his 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 farewell speech, where he warned about the military industrial complex. What does it say about him as a communicator that that rhetoric had such impact on American thought and consciousness, well beyond his life? Well, of course, I would be the first to thank his uh, speech writers for some help in that, <laughs> but they but they were all really. Um, a little bit nervous about him because he had been a speechwriter for General Douglas MacArthur in his youth. He was a wonderful writer, um, and I would recommend to um, everyone at ease stories I tell to friends. It's his voice. He wrote every word of it himself. No, no ghostwriter there. And he had a very um, plain but powerful way of of communicating. Uh, as one of his speechwriters said, he was death on superlatives. And he absolutely did not want to put anything into the speech that couldn't be verified. Um, in any case, um, uh, I think he was uh, also brave uh, to tell it like he saw it. Uh, and he, you know, he was greeted with a fair amount of opposition, um, certainly uh, towards the end of his administration. Uh, but his farewell address um, lives today, and and don't we often quote it? Um, the military-industrial complex is one of those phrases that's entered the language. Yeah, do you know? I, I we're we're taping this in uh, late September, uh, and we're mindful of the fact that the president of the United States has just named uh, a Supreme Court justice uh, with less than about forty days till election day. Uh, President Eisenhower named a Supreme Court justice in 1956, about 38 days, if I'm remembering correctly, uh, prior to Election Day. Uh, but he had a different approach to the selection of that justice. Well, it's sort of interesting. Um, you know, the, our president of the United States currently has appointed somebody of his own party and somebody of his own views. Um, the appointment that Eisenhower made, as you say, in 1956, uh, he actually appointed a Democrat. Um, this is William Brennan, who uh, was with us for really quite some time and was a very consequential uh, justice. Uh, but I, Eisenhower did it on the basis that he thought that the Supreme Court uh, should be um, diverse um, intellectually and diverse, um, you know, philosophically. Uh, he thought it would be terrible for our country uh, if the court was packed or if it represented only the strong views of um, you know, the president's party, because uh, it's a co-equal branch of government uh, that is not elected. Um, and so he was always working towards trying to uh, undergird American confidence in their government and was afraid that if a group that hadn't been elected began to take on an ideological, um, uh, an ideological tone, 
uh, that then those who did not, uh, you know, on the other side of uh, the issue would feel like the court was uh, biased against them. He wanted uh, judicial uh, appointments. And, um, and so it was a very interesting thing. May I also say, and this is extremely important to Wayne's earlier question, is that uh, white supremacists need not apply. The Eisenhower administration was really quite ruthless about um, uh, rejecting uh, judges that uh, uh, favored segregation in any way. And uh, many of those judges, as I mentioned earlier, went on to play key roles in the desegregation of the South long after Eisenhower was gone. Do you have to be a president or a military commander to to live by and apply the same principles and policies and beliefs that your grandfather did? Or, or can can anybody go there as well? About 30 it, seconds. Yeah, I think anybody can go there. But as I said before, it is a decision. I uh, For myself, I think we were lucky that we had a military man uh, who was arguably the most nonpartisan president we've had since uh, certainly the 20th century. Um, and, you know, um, he put his country first. And we should remember that and strive for it. <laughs> can, you know, we got literally about uh, 15 seconds left here. Uh, can we get back to that kind of leadership in this country without it being taking a, 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 a global calamity like World War II to produce a somebody like Eisenhower? I think it's all it's all a personal opinion. There's an enormous there are more uh, political independents uh, than there are Republicans or Democrats. This is a huge group of people who are waiting for somebody to talk to them. And I dare say we've still got a, a, a middle way, a potential middle way here. But we have to work to give voices to those who don't identify with either party. Susan Eisenhower, thank you so much for being with us. The book is How Ike Led. You should check it out. That's all the time we have this week. I'm Jim Lutis for G. Wayne Miller, asking you to join us again next time for more Story in the Public Square.